Hi, my name is Will and I'm on P the Media team and today is the Winter Poetry Recital and we are going to see our two poets, Lila and New York City. Buildings being built, tall buildings towering over you. Cars speeding, rushing by, planes soaring, roaring in the sky. New York City, vibrant city, at night it's bright and day it's okay. People trust to fast, speed, like the wind, red race car. Rides on, whoosh, into the sunset, orange, red, and yellow, smooth and shiny, like a fresh picked apple, speeding down, slippery hill. Hi, my name is Mr. Paras. I own Snapology, and uh, we are here today to do um, Star Wars Robotics and introduce the kids about uh, uh, robotics. So, uh, what are the kids doing now? Today, we are going to do what's called Space Chase. So, in Star Wars, we have an X-Wing fighter and a TIE fighter, and basically they're going to be making a little model of each and have the two fighters um, chase each other. That's cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So, um, so you know, I created this um, design and it's got a bunch of gears and pulleys and belts and motors and sensors in there and uh, it's a great way for kids to learn, you know, about all of these different technologies in a fun and engaging way. Thank you. Sure. What if we change them around? What if the first gear had eight teeth and the second gear? Rubber band is not. Like if it's twisted and the other is not. Okay. Ours are both twisted though. Yeah. Okay, so they're, they're, these are not called rubber bands, these are called uh, belts. So they're pulleys and belts. My name is Savannah, and I am an educator for Snapology. Hi, Savannah. Can you tell us what do you think about what the kids are doing today? Yeah, today we are doing a Star Wars lesson. Um, the kids seem to be enjoying it. They're learning about gear ratios and about sensors and. Um, Programming, a little bit of programming to count um, how many times their starfighters are moving around. Wow, thank you. Hello, my name is Leah Howley, and I won the Fall into Fun Snapology Engineering Star Wars event. And this is my friend Johnny. Hello. Hi, what do you think about what we had you had to do today? Well, it was really fun, and I liked doing the engineering, it, it was cool that it was Star Wars themed. Yeah, I love Star Wars. I have like five Lego Star Wars sets in my room. So I thought it was intriguing. Miss, the instructor said two rules. One, to have fun, and one, you must learn something. What did you learn? Um, I, I had fun and I learned something. Well, I learned how, I learned what the different pieces were, like that, the, um, the, there was like a gear, and then I forget what the other piece is called, the, um, the axles, and then, and I also learned a lot of coding techniques about debugging. It was really cool. Thank you. Thank you! Kyle, what? 
is your thoughts on the movie that is currently premiering in the auditorium right well, now? Well, I don't, I don't really, I'm not the biggest fan of Wally since I watched it a few times. Um, I don't really like Wally that much. It would probably be boring just to only see. It has some moments, but it's like sometimes it's just not the best. And if there would be a movie you were premiering, what would it be? If it would be. Yeah, and if there too. was one that you would not be premiering, which one would that be? Frozen. Frozen. Thank you for your time. I'm kissing Kyle. Nice interview with you. So, Ida, what do you think of the movie that they are premiering in the auditorium right now? I like um, their choice, but I think maybe they should be If you could be premiering the movie, Star Wars, mm -hmm. and if they were one you would not pick and not allow the school to do, what would it be? Thank you for your time, Ida. Something that you really like about peacocks? Um, their feathers on their back, they're all different colors. Wow, that's cool. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Missy Rich from Winning Lane. Hi, Missy. What are you dressed up as today? I'm dressed up as an elf. And who is your little pet there? My pet? My pet's name is Prancer. And where'd you get his name from? Well, you know, this song, um, Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer, and how they started off with all the reindeer's names. I really like Prancer, so I got it from there. That's why I brought my pet, well, my elf's pet reindeer. Thank you, Missy. You're welcome. Thank you for interviewing me. Is it hard 
about coming into a new school? If so, why? It was a little bit hard coming into a new school because this is only my second job. So before coming here, I was a teacher in Portland for four years. So it was the first time I ever switched jobs. And it was kind of hard um, to come in. First when I came in during the summer, first of all, everything in this room was in the middle of the room. So I had to figure out where I was gonna put stuff and where everything was gonna go and what I needed and what I didn't need. What is the process of picking student singers for choir in Terrell? Okay, so in Terrell was, obviously was my first time doing anything like in Terrell, so I was kind of learning as I went along. And luckily, um, I have the opportunity to meet with all of the music teachers in the district, usually a couple times a month. So they were really great in teaching me how um, that process works. So I was able to have fourth and fifth graders come during their recess time to practice ahead of time. Um, and they worked really hard on the round and their solos. And we got to a point where each of those kids was able to do sort of like a pre-audition for me. And at that point, I sort of determined who sounds like they're really ready for the audition. Hi, my name is Steve Poole, and I'm starting up four shots for Jacob. It's simple. Take a fun video of you shooting four hockey shots for Jacob, post it on social media, and then challenge four friends to do the same thing. If shooting on net isn't your thing, then maybe you can make a donation of any amount to the Jacob Roger Poole and Foundation to help build Jacob's Park. I just want people to think of Jacob while they have fun playing his favorite game, hockey. Okay, four shots for Jacob. You ready, Gabba? Four shots! Take right, I'd like to nominate Sarah Pullman, Philip Nicolescu, Julia Nicolescu, Jacob's coaches, Coach Mike, Coach Matt, Coach Allison, Coach Garrett, Coach Derek, uh, my buddies Freddie Bogalis, Jimmy Gilbert, Kevin Manley, and Teresa Cavanaugh. Okay, four shots for Jacob. Let's do this. Top shelf for Jacob.
talk to anybody else this morning. I'm feeling really sad about what's going on in our government. There's a government shutdown. We've got people now uh, who are government employees who aren't getting paid. Um, and the DACA situation, I'm thinking about all of our brothers and sisters out there in the world who can't concentrate on jobs, can't concentrate on schoolwork. So I feel a real sense of trauma, and I just want to make sure uh, for anybody else who's feeling that in the room, that let me name that. I'll just say right off the bat, is there anyone here who's worried that you're going to, a white person who's worried that today is going to be about blame and shame, especially if you're a white man? <laughs> Not a coincidence. So, uh, we are here to look at systems that we were either born into, if we were born in this country, or that we have to navigate if we come to this country. Nobody here invented this thing. And if we can't step back and, and look together at the system that wants to turn us against each other, um, then there's no hope. Okay, so we're going to start this morning with this concept of, I'm a good person. Isn't that enough? <laughs> and that's exactly the thought that was running through my head for 25 years when I was on diversity committees. And I realized that not only I'm a good person, isn't that enough, is not helpful, it's really not helpful because it holds us from learning. Well, we're all walking around with our own belief systems. When um, I encounter a news article, a person, a comment, conversation, I'm going to tap into what I already know to make meaning of it. What does that mean if my belief system is full of errors, omissions, and flat out lies? I'm going to be drawing faulty conclusions all the time, which if you've read my book, you know is exactly what happened. When we think about our own belief systems, we have to go way back because childhood is when they get laid down. So I'm going to share today uh, my childhood belief system uh, and how it got developed and then how it has impacted my ability to make meaning of the world around me. So Winchester, Massachusetts, where I grew up. So Winchester, from my experience, was uh, um, exclusively white. I had two Asian friends in the course of my childhood. So I'm going to call it for the purpose of this talk, my exclusively white childhood white bubble. It looked like this on the inside in the 1960s. Anyone know who this artist is? So Norman Rockwell is a white illustrator, um, and he is charged with depicting the all-American life in the Saturday Evening Post. This is exactly what my life looks like, what my cousin's life looks like, neighborhood, other neighborhoods I visit across New England, and how convenient that what I'm being told is all American looks exactly like mine. This is, again, this is a belief system. This is all settling in in a way where there's really no friction. There's no dissonance. It just makes so much sense. This is what being American looks like. So what's happening to me in Winchester that I don't know uh, until decades and decades later is what sociologists or people who study neural pathways would say, whiteness is being normalized. And it's not just the optics of whiteness, it's not just what people look like, but it turns out that there's such a thing as the white culture. There are white cultural norms. I'm embodying it right now. In my household, my parents, who were really loving people, um, you know, they had a phrase that was perfectly acceptable uh, in our house, which was, uh, if you can't be pleasant in polite company, which meant angry, sad, grumpy, go to your room and don't come out until you can be. And, you know, what that meant, that message for me meant that there was something really wrong when I was down or when I was angry. And I developed a lot of shame around both of those things. So what does this mean for people in our society who have legitimate rage and, and, and complaint and aren't doing it gratuitously, but are doing it trying to achieve a more just world? People like me will make a snap judgment if I, if I don't dig into my childhood and realize that it's me who has a problem with anger because I was taught to have a problem with anger, I can't tolerate my own anger. How good am I at tolerating other people's? So also a sitting duck to be fed stereotypes and have nothing in my belief system that helps me go, hmm, that doesn't feel quite right. Does anyone know the Babar story? <laughs> 
So on the little white kid in Winchester, these are the protagonists in the context of the story. These are Babar's cousins, and they're being attacked by what I'm being told are the, Af are the cannibal savages jumping out of the jungle in Africa. So if this is one of my earliest exposures to people who um, have dark skin, and especially look what's on the actual next page in the actual book. Civilization. Phew. <laughs> For me, civilization as a kid, it was only ever presented as white European and European, white European descended and European people. Those were the civilized people, and everybody else was savage, subhuman, dangerous, different, weird, other, accents, eyes, hair, weird. What an old piece of the American narrative that is. But I have to challenge everyone to say, aren't we all exposed every single day? to ideas that some people are more valuable than others in the context of the United States of America. What am I supposed to think as a little girl with a developing belief system when I see again and again that there's a very specific type of human being that keeps appearing as the in-charge, knows-best variety? So never, if you, said if you said, Debbie, picture a group of really successful business people or investment bankers, this is who comes up. Never would these 50 black successful business people and bankers come up. Does anybody know who these 50 black men are? Yes. Black Wall Street. Okay, this to me is this mind-blowing piece of US history. So a couple generations post-emancipation uh, from slavery, we have got, we, the United States of America, has got black communities forming in every urban area. Uh, working together to create black stability, black wealth. Let me tell you about Black Wall Street, which as a history major, I never heard about. It was about 48 blocks, 600 um, businesses, 21 churches, 21 restaurants, 30 grocery stores, two movie theaters, six private airplanes, one hospital, one bank, and its own school system. It was considered one of the most affluent neighborhoods in all of the country. How could I not know? Wouldn't it have been helpful for me, little white girl in Winchester, to know that white people and white men aren't the only people who know how to succeed and work hard? That it had been bombed into extinction in 1921. Memorial Day, 1921. Until 9-11, this was considered the number one act of domestic terrorism on US soil. So white people went in and they started throwing um, fireballs into people's homes and businesses. And as the black folks walked out, they just pegged, they just gunned them down. And as this, it lasted for about uh, 36 hours, as the time went on, the white uh, the white Tulsa police force got involved on the side of the white people. The National Guard came in on the side of the white people, and finally the Air Force and bombed mm. from the sky. How can we not know about this? But I want to know that. I want to know I'm attached to that history. Maybe that will explain why I, I feel that elephant in the room feeling. Maybe that will explain why I'm so afraid of saying something stupid and ignorant. Because I will, because I don't know. So my father was in World War II. His, and um, he got GI Bill benefits when he came back. Give you a low interest rate mortgage to go buy a house, free higher education, farm loan, <coughs> small business loan. I didn't know that the GI Bill was, for all intents and purposes, a white-only bill. I didn't know the 1.2 black GIs, 1.2 million black GIs in World War II were mostly unable to access the GI Bill. Hold everything. Did I know there were 1.2 million black GIs? Totally not. Where were they in my history books? In my movies? Poetry? Name it. In my neighborhood, no, none happened. I remember that 1930s, the suburban sprawl, the urban renewal, the high building of the highway system. So when that happened, it was a very intentional government program to expand housing options for Americans. And when they did that, they invented this thing called the mortgage. So um, the government, turns to private banks and says, hey, we recognize that we're putting you in a new business here, so we're going to give you some guidelines to think about how to make your loans safely. And mostly we want you to keep two things in mind. One, the condition of a building. Condition number two, the skin color of the residents. 
So written into our government guidelines are the words, the presence of even one or two non-white families can undermine real estate values. Instead, banks all over the country laid out maps of their cities and engaged in a practice called redlining. So the areas outlined in red are considered hazardous investments. That's where the black or black and brown people live. Green is where white only live. And uh, you know your city better than I do, but in many cases, the housing footprint that this laid down is still intact. So, I don't know any of this. I grew up in Winchester. I go to Kenyon College. I come out, and so I encounter neighborhoods that look like this. And what do you think my belief system tells me? So I start tapping into all this stuff I've been taught my whole life. Oh, wow, their families probably don't really care about education. Hmm, they really, maybe they're not that intelligent, probably lazy, don't really know how to take care of their homes, no idea this is like a white-owned slum landlord situation. And what I couldn't see was that these are two outcomes of the exact same program. So yeah, so this stuff, imagine teaching this to young children. Um, it's at some point we have to break the cycle of denial and ignorance. So one of the things that's happening uh, in terms of racial dynamics is people of color have been taught not to share their truth, which keeps white people ignorant and fragile. So that's really where we are, just in this mess. James Baldwin says white people are trapped in a history they don't understand. And boy, do I relate to that.